Hello, I'm Mark Asprey of the CBA, and today we're going to look at getting an online drawing into a more usable format for the workshop or classroom setup. There are a few variations of this grill out there, uh, and I don't believe that we care which one you use, just so long as you provide the drawing when you submit your work. But if you're talking to an instructor or coach, make sure that they know which version you're working with as their advice may fluctuate accordingly. I'm going to thread a couple of needles with this chat. Um, one is just to get you a passing grade. And then secondly, uh, we're going to take a tangent and just look at what it takes uh, as you present this sort of work to a client or so. Russ Everts of the Northern Rockies Group has uh, done a very exhaustive document detailing the level two grill and this is featured on the Abana website abana.org it's better than the CBA version at the moment so go to the education and funding drop down menu first click on that that's going to produce this page and then go to the level two click on that click on the technical drawing this is a 12 page PDF well worth it and then you're going to download that to your computer. Here's one page of the, um, the document. You can see he's got some 3D images. As well as having a 3D image of the grill, Russ also goes into the engineering side of things of what each scroll should look like. So a very useful resource. Page uh, 11 and 12 are the drawing documents. Uh, so make sure you've got those highlighted and then make sure that you're going to 100%. If you can't do 100% printed problems or whatever, go as large as you can, but again, don't forget to bring your drawing uh, with you when you go for assessment, and make sure that you actually are measuring across your drawing and not relying on the measurements from the drawing, because they'll no longer be accurate. So if you can't print 100%, you're going to have to take your unique measurements directly from the drawing. Russ has done a very good job of organizing this so you should be able to print it on your home computer. And he has got these marks here um, that you can tape the next sheet across. And you can see that's written on the top there. There we go. Uh, so you can align the two pages. The other page doesn't have this text on it. I'm going to ask you to draw a line across the other page and then cut the excess off from the other page. Don't just fold it as it will get in your way later when you start to transfer the drawing. Line the two pages up and then tape them so they become one. At least remove some of the frustration for you. And now we're going to transfer the drawing. But why do we transfer a drawing? Um, the main reason is that the paper drawing is delicate in a workshop environment, especially a blacksmith shop environment. Uh, you're offering up your scrolls as you're trying to make these and see if they fit the drawing. And sooner or later, you're going to burn up your drawing. You can uh, use a paper drawing quickly if you need to by putting it on a flat metal surface and then getting it wet with a beaker of water or so. And that way it's not going to burn, but it will brown out. Um, and that's a temporary uh, measure. If you're going to make the grill, you need to transfer the drawing to a piece of sheet steel. And the sheet steel can be rusty or it can be new. I'm going to delve into the rusty side first, and then I'm going to come back and we'll look at putting on to new sheet steel. You're going to need some sticky tape. You're going to need some chalk. I use soapstone, but blacksmith chalk is probably more desirable. You're going to need a file or a rasp, and that's so that you can convert this chalk into dust. And then you're going to need a colored pen. Blue, red, green, I don't care, not black. And then you're going to need some form of taking measurements from the drawing. A bit of string helps, some soft wire helps, nothing too stiff. And a piezometer, which is just a map reading device. You can get these from your local truck stop or a pair of dividers. And I'm going to work with a pair of dividers. 
luckily I have a lot of rusty tin plate knocking around so that's what I'm going to use. Um, so first of all cut this uh, rusty tin plate, I think mine is about, uh, that rusty plate, mine is about 12 inches by 18 inches or so. I'm using a Beverly shear and the problem with the Beverly shear is that it's going to do two things. One, it's going to create a burr and that's very sharp and secondly it's going to roll the edge slightly. So the first thing to do is get rid of the burr and I'm giving you four methods here whether it's just a deburring tool, flat disc, a file or a piece of sandpaper. If you're going to go with the sandpaper put a piece of wood between your finger and the burr because the burr will go through the sandpaper and through your finger really quickly if you don't have the wood in place. So make sure you use the wood. And then aligning the edge of the plate just so it's straight. Don't forget you're going to be putting your frame on there which you intend to be flat. And so if it's going onto this drawing, um, the drawing needs to be flat as well. So I come across the corners of my hardy hole. I use a rounding hammer and I just take the bends out that have been caused in the cutting process. And that's going to work for my needs. It's not dead straight, but it's close enough. So the first thing you're going to do, we've got to make chalk dust, chalk powder. And so I take some soapstone, put it on my rasp, uh, create some powder. You'll notice I've got the drawing face down on my uh, sheet steel. And now I'm just going to tap the chalk dust onto the back of the drawing and rub it in. Now, if your paper is really shiny, um, then this might not work for you because it might not take the, um, the chalk. And if that's the case, you're going to have to go down to the local uh, grocery store and get one of their brown paper bags and chalk up a brown paper bag and then put that between your drawing and the sheet steel. And that way you're going to treat it like a piece of carbon paper, if you remember carbon paper. Um, so it's just going to give you a method of transferring um, the drawing onto the sheet steel. I want you to rub the chalk around vigorously. Don't just give it a token gesture. Really push it into the pores of the paper. You want to give something that when you draw on it from the other side is actually going to leave a chalk line. So rub it in vigorously and then I want you to get rid of the excess chalk by shaking it off on the side there. Don't leave it on the paper or underneath between the paper and your template uh, or your sheet steel because it's just going to make a mess. So get rid of the excess. Mount the drawing to your rusty plate and then I want you to tape it in place. So I use one long strip across the top. This long strip does not come off until you have a cold beer in your hand. Do not be tempted to take this off until you are finished. The two bits on the bottom are just tabs so that you can lift them up and have a look underneath to see what's going underneath the drawing. Um, so those you can lift off. Do not remove the piece at the top. And then I've got a rule for doing the straight lines on the sides and I have my colored pen, in this case red. I should really say that twice. I have a colored pen, in this case red. Uh, draw over the black lines with your red pen and that way you know where you've been, or more importantly, you know where you haven't been as you look uh, and make the drawing. So I've gone around the whole of the perimeter of my drawing with my red pen, uh, and now I'm going to lift up those tabs, and this is what you should see. You should see a soapstone mark underneath of your drawing. Remembering that we've not lifted off this blue tape at the top, that's still fixed. So if I have a portion of the drawing that is not complete, I can drop the drawing down, it's going to be in exactly the same place, and I can redo my um, transfer again. This soapstone is very delicate, so if you are a right-handed person, I'm going to encourage you to start inking this in, and by inking it in, I mean by using a silver pencil, and I want you to start to just reinforce those lines with a silver pencil, starting on your dominant side. That way you're not going to hit this with the heel of your hand and rub off the chalk line, as you're working over here sometime, someplace. Um, the rusty sheet is going to really quickly wear the, uh, the end of your silver pencil away, so you're going to need some form of pencil sharpener or a knife or something, uh, because you're going to want to sharpen this up a few times during this process. So here's my transferred drawing. 
and I'm ready to go to work. Now, if you are in a high traffic environment, or if you're going to take this, uh, if you're going to transport this a lot, going to your classes, whatever, then this um, drawing might not be, uh, might not work for you. You might want to make something that's just a little bit more robust. And so for me, this falls into now the method for transferring the drawing onto shiny steel um, or for new mill steel. Uh, and that is the use of a prick punch. I've shown a prick punch here. This is my normal center punch. This to me is a blacksmith's punch. It's got the uh, four sided, it's a square end, so it will blow, bubble, it'll blow the bubbles away when you're heating the stock or not allow the bubbles to form. And then this is a very sharp center punch, a prick punch, and it's used in laying out patterns on sheet steel. So going back to exactly the same method, put a paste tape across the top, and then I want you to come along and um, just put the prick punch along the edge of the drawing there. You'll notice I've not come all the way down the straight sides. I just do the corners, and then I do a token gesture in the middle somewhere. What is important to me is that I have come across the midline, and that join of the two papers is right in the middle. That's very useful. Thank you, Russ. Um, so I want you to just highlight those, because we're going to be taking measurements, and I prefer to take measurements from the center line of the scroll not from end to end. You can get away from end to end, but I prefer the center line. So you can see that um, this side of my center punch is 15 inches. This side is 15 and a half. This side is 15, 15 and a half. So let's supposing you put a very nice something there. Let's say you were dealing with heavier bar and you'd punch and drifted a hole and you want it to be in the middle. Well, if you just align according to the measurements end to end, then this is going to be off by a quarter of an inch. So if you start with this in the middle and then measure out to each end, then your decorative piece is going to be in the middle of the scroll when you've finished. So that's my preferred method of working. Here's the result of the prick punch. A little more difficult to see on the rusty plate. It's a lot easier to see on the shiny steel uh, or new mill steel. Uh, so what you can do with this is once you've got your prick punch in, you come along here. I've used a silver pencil but I would probably go for more um, something like a Sharpie for a, a more permanent solid line. So again, uh, my preferred method of working is to come up and to isolate the center, put a little dot in there, and then measure out either side. That's not the only way you can work. You can work from one end to the other end, and you're going to start, um, let's say, making your piece that way. I prefer mine because then I know that uh, if I do something in the middle, it's actually going to be in the middle when I finish. I drop my paper back down on top of the metal plate and I use my dividers. And I use the paper here because it's got a little more tooth for the dividers. The dividers are less ten have less of a tendency to skip off. So um, and if they do skip off, you know where you've been. So I drop the drawing down. And again, I'm measuring out from that center line, and I've got mine set at half an inch. Half an inch is just about right. Uh, it'll go along the neutral axis of any bend here, so I'm facing down the middle. And then when you come across the um, where it starts to get a lot more curved, you're not dealing with such a long uh, cord. If you had them set at an inch, then the cord measurement across there, you're going to be losing material. Half an inch is about right, so it's about a short cord. And you're going to step this all the way through to the end. Now when you're dealing with the beveled scrolls, I want you to work along the center line until you get to the end. And in fact, you need two measurements for the beveled scroll because you want to know uh, at what point the bevel starts. So if you look at my arrow, everything north of my arrow is parallel. Everything south, now you start to get that flare of the beveled scroll. And the beveled scroll is nothing more than a, uh, a cone frustum, uh, or just a truncated cone, if you will. And so to make a cone, you bend the stock the hard way, then you bend it the easy way. And that's exactly what you're going to do when you make this scroll. You're going to bend it the hard way, and then you're going to bend it the easy way to make the cone. But you make your bend the hard way starts right here, 
because that's where the cone starts. So you need that measurement as well from your drawing. The other thing about taking measurements is they do not factor in any stretch of the material as you make the scroll finial. So you're going to have to take that into account. So I do some test pieces. I come back from the end of the bar at say six inches or so. In this case, I'm making the fishtail scroll. And so I go through the steps of whatever it is to make the fishtail scroll. And while it's still straight, I retake my measurement, which was originally six inches. And you can see now it is six and seven eighths. So I've had seven eighths of an inch stretch. And so if my center to the end of that particular scroll measured, let's say 15 inches, then I'm going to cut the bar at 14 inches and one eighth, knowing that it's going to grow seven eighths as I make the finial to become the 15 inches. For the halfpenny snub end scroll, I'm going to work all the way down the neutral axis of the bend, so I'm not factoring in for compression or stretch or tension, and I'm going to just come across the end and I'm going to finish my pace right out here, right on the tip there. And you can see I'm at 15 and a half inches of material from the center. And then I'm going to do a test piece. Here's my, this is a halfpenny, I think that's a 1903 halfpenny. And it's just a little bit bigger than your US quarter. I think it's an inch uh, in diameter. And so you'll go through, uh, you can see this is quite involved making the halfpenny. That stretches the bar quite considerably. I think mine was an inch and a half, just from memory. Uh, you'll have to do your own test piece. And then that gets subtracted from your, um, your measurements for the steel. So measure from here back to your six inch datum, see how much the bar grew, and then subtract the excess or the stretch from your original measurements. Well, that's it from me. That's transfer in the drawing. So you should now be going and looking for the uh, how to make the scrolls, and then you're going to do the test pieces and do your um, data measurements. So good luck with the grill, and I'll see you in the next one.